Light Church. You may be seated. Praise God. You may be seated. If you would like a scripture sheet, um, go ahead and raise your hand and Eliana will pass one out. Praise God. God is good. Amen. 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 God is good. Praise the Lord. All right. So what we're going to be talking about today is something that's absolutely vital, 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 vital for transforming the Christian from the point of salvation into the fullness of Christ. Okay, because remember, we've been talking a lot about salvation. We've been talking a lot about our responsibilities to God. You know, we've been talking a lot about his sovereignty and how involved he is in our life and how involved he can be in our life if we let him in. But some of us don't let him in because either we're, we're fearful, maybe we stand in condemnation, whatever it is. There's many reasons why people don't let God in. For me, personally, I used to be very scared of God. I was, I was, I was very deathly afraid of saying, God, have your way in me. But when I overcame that, there was a peace and a joy that washed over me in a way that I'd never even imagined. So we have to be able to surrender to God fully. And one of the things that will keep you from surrendering to God is your thought process, how you think about God, how you perceive Him, how He comes across to you based on His Word. So before, before we get into the message today, which is, we're going to be talking about the mind, okay? Because it will either work for you or against you. But specifically, the unrenewed mind will work against you. So before we get into that, let's do a very short recap of what we did last time, because it's very critical, because last time ties into today. Okay, so remember that we said that faith is a substance, right? It's a substance that we believe to be real. That we believe to have real, to be real and have complete and total confidence in. Okay, and what was that substance? Do you remember? It was the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is what we have faith in. It's what we have hope in. That's what restores us. Okay, that's what lifts us up. That's where we have our redemption. Okay, it's an invisible fourth with a, with a visible outcome. Our faith produces the things that we see in our life, good or bad. It's a force that operates outside all of the natural circumstances of this world. And that's good, church. That's good because that faith is the blood of Jesus and that blood is for you. It's with you and it will never stand against you. God is always on your side is what I'm saying. And all the forces of hell and all the gates of hell will not prevail against you because you are the church. The blood of the Redeemer covers you. You are filled with the Spirit of God. And He is for you, with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And no weapon formed against you will ever prosper. That's the truth. But we have to get that truth in our heart. And that's, that all starts with the blood of Jesus, recognizing what it's done in our life. Now, do you remember that it, did, it does primary, primarily three things, the blood of Jesus? One thing it does is forgiveness of sin. And we know that, right? It's the cancellation of penalty and the removal of guilt. And of course, we know this leads to salvation. But how many of us, we've heard all this before. All of y'all have heard that the blood of Jesus cancels the penalty of sin. Okay, It covers us, it forgives us. But a lot of people don't receive the other end of that, which is forgiveness, which is compassion. Because I'll tell you this right now, if right now in your heart, if you are condemned in your heart from any way because of your actions then you're not receiving the benefits of the blood of Jesus. Because one of the benefits is removal of guilt. And if you are still guilty, there's only one person in all existence who will put guilt on you, and it's not God. It's the devil. It's Satan. He's the only one who will ever condemn you. So it's very, very important that as we start this mind renewal series that we're going to do, that you understand the basis of mind renewal. You must renew your mind to the truth of this gospel. And the gospel says that the blood of Jesus not only has forgiven you, but it has completely wiped away the penalty of sin and the removal of guilt. So if you still have guilt in your heart, all you're doing is beating up yourself. The enemy is using your own mind against you to destroy you. Because people who don't receive forgiveness don't give forgiveness. Okay? People who have lived a rough life and are prideful, they are the, and this because they received it somewhere or some point in their life, and they turn around and give it to other people, not even knowing that they're doing that. That's because their minds and their hearts have been reprogrammed to respond to that stimulus in a certain way. Like if you grew up with a parent who was physically abusive, chances are you're going to be physically abusive to other people. It's not your fault. It's what you learned. It's, it's embedded into your DNA, so to speak, into your mind. But what I'm telling you is all that can be wiped out. All that can be wiped out. Patterns can be changed. Behavior can be changed. All that stuff comes with renewing your heart, renewing your mind to the truth. 
There is a way out, church, is what I'm telling you. There is a way out from where you are stuck, but you've got to want it bad enough. And you also have to, at the very basis of your Christianity, understand what the blood does. You must, must understand what the blood does. And the second thing it does is redemption, which is not only a clearing of guilt, but it's a removal of condemnation. You must understand that you are forgiven. The penalty of sin has been paid for. Guilt is no longer above you. It's below you. But not only that, guys, you cannot be condemned because guilt and condemnation, they go together. If you're a Christian and you're under guilt and condemnation, you will not do anything for God. And if you do, you will not do it very joyfully, if at all. That guilt and condemnation is meant to shut you down, church. It's meant to shut you down. This is where the devil puts you under his heel, under his thumb, and he puts guilt and condemnation on you. He'll use the closest family members. He'll use your best friend. He'll use whatever he can to make sure you stay condemned. He'll send people to talk about you. He'll send people to, oh, well, so-and-so did this. Oh, he's just a horrible person. He'll do all that. He'll do whatever he can to make sure you're shut down. But I'm telling you right now, the blood of Jesus has covered all of that. The blood of Jesus has forgiven all of that. So if you stand before God, you should stand before God knowing that you are free of guilt, you are free of condemnation. My Father in heaven does not stand here accusing you. The devil does. But what did Jesus do? He paid for that. He's the one who goes before the throne and says, Nuh-uh, the accuser, you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that to the Son of God. I paid for that sin with my precious blood. And our Father in heaven says, case dismissed. No guilt, no condemnation. So the devil can be the squeaky wheel all he wants because all he's going to do is get greased. And we're the ones that are going to grease him. Amen? Amen? So the third thing that it does is transformation. This is the creation of the new species. It's the new creature or species that has never, ever been seen before. A change of kind, so to speak. You are a new creation. And after the new creation is created... Then we start working on the mind. Then we start working on renewing you. Then we start reprogramming you to walk as sons and daughters of God. Because many people, they only come to salvation. And they stop right there. They never do mind renewal. They never reprogram themselves for, for the new hardware they got. And so they're operating on old software. And old software don't work so well with new hardware. If you're a new creation, you need new creation software. Okay, And that's some of what we're going to talk about today. So this is all part of your sanctification. And this is all made possible with the blood of Jesus. Now look at Hebrews 10.9. It says, He takes away the first that He may establish the second. The first is the old covenant. okay, And the, and the new covenant is what? Grace. Mercy. All made possible by the blood of Jesus. And in verse 10 it says, by this, we, by this will we have been sanctified. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus was per perfect for us, right? He was perfect in every way because he knew we couldn't be. But he says once and for all, guys, once and for all. That means you're covered past, present, and future for anything you could do against God. You're covered. So you should never walk in condemnation because if you stand condemned, you won't be able to move forward. You, you got to understand what I'm saying. If the grace message is preached right, people should ask this question. So you're telling me that everything's been paid for. All condemnation, all guilt, the payment of sin has been paid and satisfied in Christ Jesus. You're telling me that I can, I can go and sin and never have repercussion for my sin? If the grace message is preached right, a person will ask that question because that's what, exactly what it sounds like. And the answer is no, of course not. There is always the other side of sin, okay? And I've told you this many times. If a person continues in willful sin, sin hardens your heart towards God, Okay? And to the point where you can end up rejecting them if you don't stop living a life of sin. That's what happens. How many of you have seen people who were once in the church, okay, and they were doing good and they backslid, and none of the members of the church went to go rescue that person. They kept sliding back and sliding back, and their hearts, the people who were once in love with God, end up despising God, end up turning against God. Why? Because sin has hardened their hearts against them. It's not that they're not forgiven. They are forgiven. They may not feel forgiven. They may be full of guilt and condemnation and they can even show their face in church. But the truth is God still loves them. God has forgiven them. And all they need is brotherly love to restore that person back. Okay? But if a person never repents of their sin and they just get that far away from God, they're going to end up rejecting Him. If it were possible to lose your salvation, if it were possible, it would be because you rejected Christ. It would be because you rejected God. And that's the danger of sin. 
So when someone says, I can sin and, and I'm good, no, it's not. Because if you continue sin, you can end up rejecting God altogether. So sin is very, very dangerous. And a little bit of sin will ruin everything. The scripture says a little leaven will ruin the whole lump. Sin is leaven, guys. If you let a little bit in your life, it has a very strong potential to spread like a disease, like a cancer. That's why it's so important that you destroy it. This is a perfect walk towards God. It's not about you being perfect. It's not you being sinless. A perfect walk towards God is this, that when you mess up, you say, God, I'm sorry. Father, I forgive me. I repent, Lord. I know I messed up, Lord. I will do better tomorrow, God. I will do better. And then you start walking. That's a perfect walk right there. It doesn't mean you are perfect. It doesn't mean you never make mistakes. It just means you're quick to repent and tell God, I'm sorry, Lord. Let's try again. That's a perfect walk towards God. Because look at what God said about David. We know what David did with Bathsheba. Killed her husband. Why? So he could have her. He did some pretty horrible stuff. Horrible, horrible stuff. But then God says, David's a man after my own heart. How is that possible when he's a murderer? Because God doesn't get hung up on the things you do wrong. He gets hung up on the things you do right. And if your heart is always repented and torn towards God, no matter how many mistakes, if there's repentance, there's relationship. And that's how you grow to love your Father in heaven, is by having a repentant heart towards Him. Because if you don't repent, guys, your heart will grow cold and hard towards God, and you'll end up walking away from Him instead of walking with Him. That is the danger of sin. Okay? In a nutshell, that is the danger of sin. Let's look at this next verse here. Hebrews 10.14 For by one offering, He, Jesus, has forever perfected those who are sanctified. You are all perfect. Before God's eyes in the throne room, you are perfect. In the natural walking, of course we're not perfect. We still have sanctification process to go through. But as far as the Holy Spirit's concerned, as far as the blood of Jesus is concerned, you're, you are in a right standing position before God. He is pleased with you. And that's what you need to remember about the blood. As far as God's concerned, he's absolutely head over heels in love with you. And he would never deny anything from you. Never. He gave you everything. And you have to realize that. You've got to stop looking at you and you've got to start looking at him. This is all part of, of the beginning of mind renewal. Is you've got to look at him and not look at you anymore because you don't matter anymore. He does because he's the one who lives in you. Jesus is the one who lives in you. The Holy Spirit is the one who lives in you. You now belong to him. So let him have his way in you. Just trust him. Just let him do what he does. He is a good father. And he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He'll give you the best that heaven has to offer. But you've got to walk towards him. You can't walk away from him. And look at this next verse here in verse 17. He says, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, you've heard me say that many times. At the moment you're covered with the blood, God chooses to never hold your sins against you. He says, I will remember your sins no more. So how many of y'all probably sinned on the way up here? You know, maybe somebody cut you off. Maybe you were just angry at somebody. Maybe you were cussing up a storm. Y'all probably sinned on the way up here. But all that is covered in the blood. And God says, it is my choice to not hold those sins against them. So I choose to remember their sins no more. And this is proof right here in the Bible that no matter what you have done, God says, I don't hold it against you. I don't ever remember it. So if you say, God, oh, I'm sorry about this. He's like, what are you talking about? All I see is the precious blood of my son that covers you. The whole point of this, guys, is that you must stand before God boldly. You must know that you are forgiven. You must know that condemnation is from the enemy and not from God. Because if you can stand boldly before the throne of grace and mercy, like he says, whatever you ask of God, you'll have it. But you've got to feel like you deserve it. Because if you don't feel like you deserve it, you feel you're unworthy, you're not, really gonna, you're not acting like a king or a queen, number one. But number two, you're double-minded. And if you're double-minded, James says you won't receive anything from God if you're double-minded. It's not that he's not giving, you just won't receive it because you're missing it. It flies right by you because you're too hung up on you. You need to be hung up on him because that's all that matters. Amen. 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 And look at the next verse here in 19. And it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus. Because of the blood of Jesus, you have that boldness I was talking about. That you can go straight into the throne room of God. Okay. And by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. So in his flesh, his blood was spilled and we were covered. Our sins forgiven once and for all. So in other words, church, what I'm trying to tell you is that the blood of Jesus gave you a fresh start. It gave you a fresh start in life. But you have to walk in that fresh start. You have to embrace that fresh start. And that all starts renewing your mind. 
If you want to live uh, that new life free of guilt and free of condemnation, then you have to start walking the sanctification out in your life. And that all starts with reprogramming yourself to think the way a a son does, think the way a daughter does in Christ. And they don't think thoughts of condemnation. They don't think about sin. They don't focus on that stuff. They focus all on him. Jesus once said to his own parents, that, don't you know that I'm about my father and his business? Told that to his own mother, to his own brother or dad. He says, hey, yeah, I know you're my natural parents, but you know what? I'm about my father's business in heaven. That's what's more important to me. Jesus made it very obvious over and over again that he was about his father and his business. That's all he cared about. And through his father and his business, God restored everybody all around him. He spent his whole ministry healing people and restoring people. That's our job. That's not just my job. It's your job too. But here's the the, the hang up there. How effective are we going to be at restoring other people when we ourselves still need restoration? It would behoove you to focus on him instead of on you. So not only will you get healed and restored, but you'll also be a blessing to other people. You can still restore people even though your heart is not restored itself. But I'll tell you this, in the process of you restoring other people, you will become restored because you're sowing a seed of life in the people and God has sown himself into you. So by you healing other people, by default, you yourself will be healed. So it's so important. So don't wait to be perfect before you start witnessing the people. Everybody in here is just as qualified as me to witness this gospel. Every single person. I don't care what you've done wrong. doesn't matter. You are... Perfectly capable, just like I am. And as far as God is concerned, you have every right to witness in this gospel. But the devil wants to make you feel condemned and shut you down so you don't share the gospel. See how that works? Because me, my healing came because I was witnessing. I was pretty broken. I was pretty hurt on the inside. I had a lot of stuff that I went through in my life with my wife and, and, and you know, just in life in general. And I had an option. Either I could shut down, push the world out, and push God out, or I could embrace God, suck it up, and just do it. And so what I did is I started loving people. I started reaching out to people. I started working on healing other people. I started working on helping people get their lives together. And through all that, I was healed because I made myself available for them. God healed me. Why? Because I healed them. So if you want healing in your life, start loving on people. Start loving on people, okay? That's part of your mind renewal process. See, God has sanctified and redeemed our spirit, right? This is all part of what the blood does. He sanctified and redeemed our spirit. But what about our soul? What about our soul? How many of y'all know there's a soul and a spirit in you? Some people don't know that. Okay? What about the flesh and the soul? So the born again, new creation experience, the moment you confess Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, you're a new creation, right? Okay? You're renewed in your spirit. Okay? But your flesh wasn't renewed and your mind wasn't renewed. Your soul wasn't renewed, okay? Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You're new. You're in a new covenant now. Everything about you is new except for your soul and your flesh, which is obvious, okay? So our spirit is the only thing that was renewed when we were born again. Our spirit was the only thing that was renewed, that was made new, okay? And our soul and body are still part of the fallen world. And the fallen world is full of what? Sin. So our soul and our body are still subject to the effects of sin in this world if we allow it, if we allow it, okay? Our flesh is renewed and redeemed when? Who knows this? When is our flesh uh, renewed and redeemed? At the rapture, at the rapture of the church, okay? Okay? And we're going to actually talk about that in the coming weeks. We're going to talk about the rapture. But it's our responsibility to renew our soul. And we have to do it with his word. It's our job to renew our soul. It's our job to renew our mind. God doesn't do that for us. We have to do that for ourselves. And this leads us to our topic today, which is the unrenewed mind. So our topic is all about the mind and how we're going to begin the process of renewing it. And the first step to begin mind renewal is to realize what an unrenewed, an unrenewed mind does to you. If you don't have an unrenewed mind, or if you have an unrenewed mind, you stay the same after salvation. You don't change. 
You go back to the vomit that you left. You go back to the same sins. You go back to the same drugs. You go back to the same bad habits. You go back to all this stuff and you repeat it over and over again. And you grow more and more frustrated because in your heart you know that it's not right. And you know that you want to change. But it's like you can't help it. You keep going back to it. You keep going back to it. How many of you ever felt like that before? That you just can't break away from those bad habits that you have. All of us have been there. Every single one of us. And the reason why that happens... It's because your mind has not been renewed to the truth of who you really are now. The old you is gone. The old you person is dead. And the only reason why you would act the way you used to act is because that old man, that old person, that old you that is dead, you keep raising him up from the dead and letting him have his way in your life. you got to kill him. He no longer has power and authority over your life. And the only way you can do that is by separating yourself from the old person. You must, you've got to see clearly your new identity. Okay, you got to see clearly your new identity. You know what? I need a. I'm going to do an example real quick. Who wants to come up here? I need a volunteer. Who wants to come volunteer? I need you to come up on that stage. Come on, come up here. You look like a good uh, doppelganger for me. So watch this. I'm going to show you something. Okay, so my brother here, he represents the new man. Okay, let's say I'm the old man. Let's say him and I were the same person. Okay, let's say he came to. You know what? Why don't you stand behind me right here? Just like this is going to look funny, okay? So let's say I confess Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior right now. Boom. I'm a new creation. Now I want you to stand right here, okay? New creation. This is the new man. This is the old man, okay? And right now, at the point of, of transformation, we're, we're still like this. We're best buds. I don't want to let him go, okay? I want to keep living what I was doing before. I want to be that unrenewed man. I want to keep the man. I want to be the man of sin. And he wants to chase a new life of Jesus. So what he's going to do He's going to start confessing God's word over himself. He's going to say, you know what? I'm a new creation. I don't need sin in my life anymore. I'm satisfied in Jesus. All my hope, my peace, and my joy is in him. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not below. So what he's going to do is start, start confessing the word of God over his life. And what happens is he starts putting distance between his old self and the new self. So now, as he starts confessing God's word over himself, stay right there, brother. He's going to start creating more distance between him and I, and him and I, and him and I. Okay? This is the old man. He's dead now. Might as well bear me and put me in a casket because I have no authority and influence over his life anymore. But the moment he starts living the old ways of life, he starts going back to the vomit from which he left behind. What happens is I start resurrecting myself from the dead and I start bringing him closer and closer and closer to me. So now he's back to where he was where he started. He may still have his salvation, but the old nature in me starts to act up in him. And people look at him like, you're supposed to be a Christian. What are you doing acting like that? He repents. He says, you know what? I reject all that old stuff. I don't want that old life anymore. And then he starts putting distance again between me and him, me and him, to the point where the old man is so far away from him that all he can see clearly is Jesus. Because right now, he's close to me. And he's going to go like this. He'll look at the old self and look at Jesus. Look at the old self and look at Jesus back and forth. But eventually, he's going to get so far away from me that he's not going to be able to see me anymore. And all he's going to see is Jesus. That's how transformation starts. You have to put distance between the old you and the new you. The new you is created in righteousness and holiness, made to please God, no longer to please you. But if you keep pleasing the flesh and, changing, and chasing after the old ways of life, I'm going to be on him like this. I'm never going to let him go, and I'm never going to change. I'm going to be the same forever. And you cannot live a redeemed life. You cannot live a life free of guilt and free of condemnation if you're like this with your old self. You have to put that distance. you got to get rid of the old self. Amen? Amen? Okay. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. So just a visual on, how, on what my point of this little mini-series is about the renewed mind. You have to visibly see yourself. And you see how that happened? You had two images here. You had the image of the renewed person, and you had the image of the old person. How many of y'all, does that have more clarity? Because you literally have to see the old self, and you also have to see the new self. Your new identity is in Jesus. So you need to see Jesus in you, okay? You have to see Jesus in you. Because if you cannot see Jesus in you, all you're going to see is the old person, and you're going to act like the old person. You're going to continue to resurrect the old person from the dead. So what is our soul? Because an unrenewed mind is basically a soul that is running on old software. I was the old software. He was the new hardware. And you can't run a new hardware with an old software. It won't work. It'll, all things will, will just be horrible. It just won't work. So what is the soul? Well, look at Genesis. 
Look at Genesis 2.7. And it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's what animates you. That's why you're able to walk around right now because of a soul. You have a soul. Okay? A soul means this. The Hebrew word means a living, breathing being with desire, appetite, mind, emotion, and passion. Do you hear what I just said there? Your desire, your appetite, your mind, your emotion, your passion comes from your soul. Comes from your soul. So if you desire to do wicked things, that's coming from your soul. Because that's what your soul is reprogrammed to do. Okay? Now look at the... That was a Hebrew. Now look at the Greek of the same word. This is psyche. Where have we heard that before? Psyche. How about psychiatrist? Okay? So the soul means this. It's, again, the breath of life. The vital force which animates the body. It's the seat of the feelings. It's the, the holding place of your feelings, your desires, your affections, your aversions, the things you don't like. It's your heart and your soul. It's who you are. Your soul is an image of who you are. The way you act is a, is a snapshot image of your soul, of your heart. Okay? Now look at this. The soul is the seat of the mind. Okay? The appetite, the emotions, and the passions, right? And the soul is also the activity center of your mind, your will, and your character. Your soul, guys, is the activity center. That means that's where everything starts. That's your data center. That's where everything starts. Right in your soul. Your soul will affect your mind, it will affect your will, and it will affect your character. Some people have a very good character, like people have very good work ethics. Some people are, are go-getters and they get it all done, rain, sun, or shine. That's part of your character. That's part of your soul. That's what's been ingrained into your soul. And then some people have some really bad habits that's ingrained into their soul. So what do we have to do? We have to get the Word of God to push that old stuff out so you can be renewed to His likeness. To His likeness. So what's the summary of, of these two definitions here? Your soul is your mind your will, and your emotion. Your soul is your mind, your will, and emotion which can direct your thoughts, your desires, your actions of your flesh. Your soul basically tells you what to do. But it shouldn't be like that. The Spirit of God that's in you should tell your soul what to do. Should tell your mind what to think. Should tell your heart what to meditate on. Not the other way around. Most people live their life backwards and they don't even know it especially when it comes to Christians. How many of y'all seen people before they were saved had a pretty good life, man? You know, they weren't saved, but they had a, a great life and they did this and they did that. But the moment they came to salvation and accepted Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, it's like everything went downhill in their life. Like the whole life fell apart. Why? Because now that person is a target for Satan and the person never renewed their mind. And because of that, they're trying to live an old life in a new Jesus suit and it doesn't work out so well. Because the devil may have left you alone when you didn't know Jesus Christ as Lord. Why? Because he never wanted you to come to Christ. He wants you to have a good life. That way you never have a reason to lean on Jesus. But the moment you stab the devil in the back and you come to Jesus, say, I want to start living for Jesus now, he's going to make sure, number one, your mind is never renewed. And number two, he's going to start kicking you. When he once left you alone, he's going to start beating up on you because you are now a target, because you are a Christian. That's why a lot of people who come to Christ, their lives don't get better, they get worse. Because they have to learn how to fight. They have to learn how to renew their mind, their body, and their soul to God's will. And if you don't do it, you're going to get beat up. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't renew to your new identity, the devil is going to have his way with you. And it's going to hurt. But thank God he is so gracious and so merciful and so kind that he will send you helpers. He will send you people into your life to help you overcome that. And the reason why, guys, I, I'm so... I would say ferocious or bold when, when the devil comes around because I hate him. I absolutely hate him. I can't stand what he does to people. The spirit of fear that he puts on people, it just ruins people's lives. And to me, I used to be a victim of the spirit of fear. And I, I can't, when I smell him, just a hint of him, boy, I just, my guns come up and I want to fight immediately because I cannot stand him. I hate him. And I don't want him in, to ever have a way or a little slice of any of us. That's why I'm so passionate about this gospel because he has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I'm not going to let it happen on my watch. I don't want him anywhere around any of you, any of our listeners, any of our congregation who's our extended family. 
I want him out. That's why I'm so passionate about this gospel, because I hate him and I love him. I hate the devil, but I love my father. When you start renewing yourself, that's the kind of attitude you're going to have. You're going to hate sin. You're going to hate everything the devil does. And every time you see it, you're going to want to destroy it. Because that's what a good soldier of Christ does. Amen? So the soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion. It will affect your thoughts, your desires, your actions, and your flesh. It's what's in your heart. And if it directs and dictates your decision, then it has power over you. You don't want your soul to have power over you, especially if it's not renewed to God's new image for you. Okay? So we have to remove our soul from the seat of power. You must remove your soul from the seat of power. Your soul cannot tell you what to do. The Spirit of God is what you must be yielded to. That is what must run your life. Okay? Now, why do we want to renew our minds other than everything I just said? Well, look what it says here in Romans 12 and 1. Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So God says, the moment you accept my son as Lord and Savior, here's your job, and it's reasonable. I'm not asking too much of you, but I want you to be a living sacrifice for me. God says this is the basics, the foundations of becoming a Christian is you must be a living sacrifice for him. And if you're a living sacrifice for God, that means you put your desires, your wants last and you put his desires and wants first. That means you're doing the gospel. That means you're sharing the gospel. That means you're doing what I'm doing just in a capacity where you go one on one. It may be family members. It may be friends. It may be someone on Facebook or text messages, but you're doing your part. That's what a living sacrifice is. When you put your wants and your desires last and you put his desires first. And God says, if you do this, if you seek the kingdom of God first, I will take care of all your desires. I will give them to you. I will take care of them. I will satisfy them. But you've got to put me first. Why do you think God wants to do that? Because he can do a way better job than you can. Way better job than you can. He does a way better job than me all the time. I always tell my wife and people, it's, you know, it's almost like God knows what he's doing, right? Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine that? God knows, knows what he's doing. <laughs> so here's the first step is mind renewal. Okay? It's required to live a life acceptable to God. And this can only happen when your soul and your mind are not the boss. The spirit of God must be the boss in you. Okay? He must have the seat of power in your life. And the second thing is this. The only way we can do God's will and prove it is through his word. Right? And the only way we can renew is through his word. So if we want to, be, if we want to be, live a life that's holy and acceptable to God, if you want to be a living sacrifice to God, then you have to renew your mind. You have to. That's the first thing you should do as a Christian is to reprogram yourself. Now look at Romans 12 too. It says, be not conformed to this world. Don't be like this world. Don't be like the old man anymore. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation comes from transformation comes from renewing your mind. So for what reason? So that you can prove that what is in this Bible is true. So that you can prove that you know what I am forgiven. I am a new creature. I don't have to be like that old person anymore. I am renewed. The only way you can prove that in your life is by walking it out. So be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you can prove God's will in your life by renewing your mind and actually doing his will. And so the only way to receive the full effects of the blood of Jesus is to renew yourself, to upgrade your software. You got the new hardware, now you got to upgrade your software. Okay? My renewal is the key to living a blessed life. How many of you want to live a blessed life? Raise your hand. Yeah? All right? All right. Of course. That all starts with renewing your mind, guys. That all starts with finding out what an unrenewed mind can do to you if you leave it like that. Okay? And many of you already know because you're living it. What an unrenewed mind can do to you. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no happiness. You're defeated by sickness, illness, and disease. You run away from God instead of running to Him. All that stuff is part of the unrenewed mind. Okay? But I'm here to tell you, guys, there's, there's hope. There's hope if you'll just grab onto it. So the moment you are saved, you, we are expected to live a life led by the Spirit of God and not of the flesh anymore. Look at Galatians 5.16. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in obedience to the Spirit of God, you won't do the old nature anymore. You won't do the old man anymore. You'll have a lot of distance between the old person and the new person if you're chasing after God. Okay, For the flesh... The flesh will lust against the Spirit of God and the Spirit against the flesh. These two things, the old man and the new man, they are in opposition of each other. 
Remember my brother was standing up here? He represents walking in the Spirit of God, and I represent chasing the, the sins of the world, okay? And the more, and we're in opposition to each other. I mean, we don't like each other. I want to bring the renewed person and condemn him. But he doesn't want to be condemned by the old person, so we have to put distance between each other, okay? These are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are not under the law. So if you're led by the Spirit of God, you won't go back to the old ways of life. But if you're not led by the Spirit of God, you and your old person will be best buds. And you'll never, ever improve in your life the way God intended you to improve. Because you're stuck in the old nature. So an unrenewed soul, causes, an unrenewed soul will cause you to fall into sin. And sin leads to guilt and condemnation. But if you're led by the Spirit of God, you will have a meaningful relationship with Jesus. A meaningful, meaning you'll be able to sit down with the Spirit of God and talk and have an actual conversation with Him and hear your Father respond back to you. How many of you have ever experienced that before? You've audibly heard God talk to you. Many of my conversations with the Holy Spirit are like that. That's how we converse. Why? Because I know His voice. I've trained my, my flesh, my mind, my body, my soul, my soul to respond to the Spirit of God. So I know when he's talking, and I know when the other guy's talking. I used to serve the other guy. I used to be one of the other guys crowning jewels. But when I left him, I seek to destroy him everywhere that I go. But I hear my father's voice, and I know my father's voice. So what would happen if we let our unrenewed soul run the soul, run the show? If your unrenewed person, the old you, was running the show, what do you think would happen in your life? Look at Galatians 5.19. The works of the flesh would come to pass. And what are the works of the flesh? Adultery, sexual immorality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. He says, I warn you, as I previously warned you, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're not inheriting the kingdom of God, that means you're missing out on all of God's promises. And if you're not saved, you're not going to heaven. So an unrenewed soul, an unrenewed mind will destroy you. And because you are a Christian, that is the devil's goal to destroy you. So you never find out who you really are. The works of the flesh would take over and cause all kinds of problems. Well, what kind of problems? Well, let's look. James 4.1. Where do wars and fights among you come from? Where are, everybody wars. People probably got in arguments with their spouses today. Maybe they got in arguments yesterday. Maybe it's been going on for a month or years or whatever, all that. Okay. Anytime you have altercations between people, where, where does that come from? Does it come from, oh, well, he was right and I was wrong? Does it come from that or is it something else? Well, James tells us, it says, Where do wars and fights among you come from? Do they not come from your lust, your own desires, that war in your own body? An unrenewed mind is set up to destroy relationships. The reason why people fight so much is because there's a portion of them that's unrenewed, and there's a portion of the other person that's unrenewed, and all they want to do is fight. Just clash, clash, clash. Why? Because that's part of the devil's plan, is to destroy relationships. And he will try his hardest to destroy everything you're trying to make in the image of God. Do you see how that works? That all comes from inside you. It's both people's faults. If you wanted to point a finger, point at each other because it's both of your faults. It takes two to tango, as they say. There is no right and there's wrong. The, the, the difference is there's an enemy and then there's the son or daughter of God. And he's the enemy trying to work in you. So recognize that it's not that other person that's trying to destroy you. It's not you that's trying to destroy that other person. It's the devil who's working through you to destroy that person. It's not even about you guys. It's about God. It's about him. It's what he wants. And it's about the enemy trying to work through you to destroy people. So what I'm saying right there is you need to forgive each other, first of all, because that's not even your fault in that sense as far as right or wrong goes. Okay? But now that you know what the problem is, if you continue to embrace the problem and not the solution, then it becomes your fault. Why? Because you know better now. Okay? So now that you know that it's not the other person, it's the enemy working through that person to try to destroy you or get under your skin, and the same thing as you towards other people, the enemy will work through you to try to get another, under another person's skin. Do you see how that goes round and round? How many of you have ever been in a household where um, it's very, very rare that everybody's happy? You also have a group of people in the household that will be happy, but there will be one person who will be grumpy. One person that ruins the whole mood for everybody. And then all of a sudden, that person's happy, but then the other people are grumpy. And then those people are happy, but then somebody else is grumpy. It goes around and around and around. How many of you have ever experienced that before? That's a spirit. 
guys. That is the spirit that does that. He'll go and use this person as a puppet to cause strife in the family. And when that person's healed from that and went on for that, now he's in a good mood, then that spirit will jump to another person and use that person as a puppet. And then on and on and on and on. Why? Because people have no idea what's going on. Their mind is not renewed to the warfare, to the warfare that's going on, so they have no idea that it's a spiritual attack. That's why you must have your mind renewed because if it's unrenewed, the enemy will beat up on you over and over and over again. You won't even know it's the enemy. You'll think it's, oh, my wife did this. Oh, my husband did that and blah, blah, blah. None of that matters. None of that matters because there is an outside force working against you to destroy your relationships, to destroy, destroy your marriage, to destroy your walk with God. And that's Satan. And that's all his demons. That's just familiar spirits that follow you around, studying you, looking at the right buttons to poke. That's what he does. Part of my renewal, guys, is to recognize what the unrenewed mind does. The unrenewed mind allows the devil to make a fool of you. Do we like that? Do we want to be made a fool of? No. That's all he's doing is making a fool of us, using us against ourselves. That's where all the wars come from nowadays. It says, do they not come from the lust of the war in your body? Okay. You lust and do not have, so you kill. You desire to have, but you cannot obtain. You fight a war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask, when you do ask, you do not receive because you're asking in the wrong way. You're asking that your flesh would be satisfied and not the Spirit of God. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your passions. So what he's saying right here, one of the benefits of having an unrenewed mind is that your heart is wrong before God. And when you're asking out of a wrong heart, you don't get what you're asking for because your heart's not right before God. In other words, you must have your, your prayers must be perfect before God when you're asking for something. Because if you're asking from your flesh, you're not going to get what you want. And if you get what you want, you're not going to like it because it's imperfect. But if your heart is right before God, you say, you're, and your person that says, God, just, just have your way in me. You know my need, Lord. You see my need. You satisfy it, Father, any way you want to. Whatever you think is best, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. You know I need a vehicle. You know I need this. You know I need that, Lord. You said you know all these things. So you know what, God? I'm giving it to you. And my heart's going to be right for you because I trust you, God. I know you'll meet my need. So I thank you that it's done in Christ Jesus. Amen. And that's it. Don't choke, don't choke out your own prayer with unbelief and, and being, well, I want this. It's got to be this way, God. It has, this has to happen and that has to happen, blah, blah, blah. You can't do that to him and expect to have what you really want in your life. Because I'll tell you that 99% of the time, God knows better for you than you know for yourself. He knows more of what you need than you need for yourself. And I tell him that all the time. Because there's a lot of times he does not give me what I ask for. And to come to find out later on, it's because my asking was not really perfect for him. It was half best on, based on my flesh and half based on the Spirit of God. So I didn't have the perfect desire before him. But when he actually showed me what perfect desire was like, and then, all right, I get it, God. I get it. I completely missed it. You know what? However you want to do it, God, just meet my need. And when he meets my need, it was everything that I wanted. And even stuff that I didn't even know that I wanted. But when I had it, oh, wow, I want that, and now I got it. In other words, God gives the perfect gifts. He makes things perfect, but you've got to let him do it. Amen. All part of your mind renewal, church. And if you don't have your mind renewed to that truth, you won't experience those huge blessings from God like that. So an unrenewed soul causes flesh wars. How many of y'all fleshed out with people? I flesh out. I'm not afraid to admit it. Because I, I, I got a portion of my soul or experience that I got to renew to the truth of God. We're, we're all guilty of that, church. Nobody's perfect. Why do you think it's so easy to get hung up on what you do wrong? Because we, some, sometimes we just mess up all the time. But if all you look is how you mess up, you never look at what God has done, you'll, need, you'll never see victory. The only way you can see Jesus in you is by putting him before you. You've got to be able to forgive yourself and you've got to be able to forgive others and you've got to move forward because if you don't, if you don't forgive, all you're doing is destroying yourself. Unforgiveness will cause disease to rise up in your body and will cause sickness, illness, and death to come upon you. That's exactly what unforgiveness does. And not only that, it opens up a can of worms for the devil to invite him into your life to have his way. And we all have experienced that before. And we can't let that do it. That's part of the unrenewed nature, and it's dangerous. He can't let that happen in your hearts or in your minds. An unrenewed mind directly affects your heart and can cause many problems. And an unrenewed soul 
would do anything to get what it wants. But the truth is it'll never be satisfied because it didn't come from God. When something comes from God, you're satisfied. When you give it to yourself, you know, it's not that great. It's not that great. Look at Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Well, God knows it. He reveals your own heart to you all the time if you'll let him. Look at Proverbs 4 and 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The unrenewed mind will directly affect your heart. It will cause all sorts of problems in your life, guys, if your mind is not renewed to this truth. So the issues of life come from where? Did it come from your neighbor next door who's loud in the middle of the night? Does it come from your spouse who only showers three or four times a day or a week and he's always stinky? Does it come from that? No, nope. it comes from your heart. Any kind of problem you have in your life comes from your heart. It's not the other person. A lot of people like to blame other people for their problems. A lot of people say, well, if you would just do this, I would be happy. Sorry, man, that's just not true. Your happiness has nothing to do with the person that's sitting across from you. Absolutely nothing has everything to do with your heart and your relationship with God. And I, I've learned that from first-hand experience. First-hand experience. Some people are looking at me right now like, how do you know I don't shower? I only shower like three or four times. How do you know that in a month's period? People are looking around like, how do you know that? <laughs> so look at this. The issues of life come from your heart, but where, where do they go next? So let's look at Matthew 15, 18. It says, but those things which proceed out of your mouth... They come from the heart. The things you say come from your heart. And those things are what defile you. Okay? Those are the things that make things bad in your life. What you speak forth is what he's talking about. It says, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Out of your heart is going to come evil thought, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and blasphemy. That all comes out of your heart. In order for it to get out of your heart, it has to go through your mouth. Right, Becky? It has to go through your mouth. So you speak death over yourself. You speak cursings over yourself. The devil doesn't have the power to curse you. The devil doesn't have the power to make your life bad. You have all the power. You have all the authority. You and you alone, based on what you speak. That's exactly what Jesus is saying right here. The make it or break it in your life completely relies, relies on you. And if your mind is renewed, then guess what you're going to speak over yourself? Truth. Redemption. Healing, forgiveness, compassion, restoration, blessing. But if you're not renewed, are you going to say, well, I have this, the doctor said that, so-and-so stubbed my toe, I don't like this person, this person did that to me 15 years ago, blah, blah, blah. And all you're going to do is speak death and defeat and cursing over your own life because your mind is not renewed to the truth of who you really are. Do you everybody see, everybody following me here, why that's so dangerous to have an unrenewed mind? It will cause your heart to betray you. Your own heart will betray you because of old thought processes, because of old way of thinking. It causes you to speak death instead of life. It will cause you issues and lead you into more sin, into more condemnation. The very nature of sin, guys, wars against your soul. There is a war right now. You understand there is a war for your soul. There is a war to steal your peace, to steal your joys, to steal your happiness, to steal your blessing. You've got to understand, guys, that the devil has a very limited time here on earth. Okay, he has a short time to live. How many of you, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow and there's nothing you could do about it, would live your life different for this whole day, would do something different? Okay, some people would go out and spend all their inheritance. Some people would go out and just love people and tell people how much they love them. Some people would go and destroy. Well, the devil knows he has a limited time. So what do you think he's playing around? He's doing everything in his power to destroy you, to destroy you. Why? Because he knows there is no tomorrow for him. He knows this. He's not playing around. There may be people here playing Christian and, pay, and playing patty cake in church, but the devil's out to destroy you just so you know. So while you're out there playing around, he's scheming on how he's going to destroy you, destroy your children, destroy your family. And he's counting and betting on your mind never being renewed to the truth so he can do it without effort. But if you renew your mind, then you're dangerous. Then you become a threat to his kingdom. Then you start shutting him down. Why do you think he tries so hard to oppress people and keep them in the old nature? He'll keep you from getting saved, but once you're saved, all right, fine, they're saved. But as long as they don't renew their mind, I know I'm okay. He'll do everything to keep you away from the truth. But when you got the truth, you're unstoppable. This is why this is so important. 
See, look at this. Look at 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter 2.11. He says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers, I'm coming to you as strangers and pilgrims, to, and I'm telling you this, to abstain, to stay away from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. The very things that you once took pleasure in that are sin, those things are literally designed to destroy you. The pleasures of sin is designed to destroy you. It's not designed to help you in any way. You may have a temporary bits of pleasure from doing that sin, but the purpose of it is, it's poison. It's meant to kill you. It is meant to kill you. A lot of people don't realize that. There could be something that's 95% good and 5% rat poison. It's the 5% rat poison over time that will kill you. And that can only happen when your eyes are closed. When you're unrenewed and you have no idea what's going on. And that's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to keep you like a dummy. He wants you to be a dummy when it comes to the word of God. He doesn't want you to know what's going on. He wants you, oh, just go find a happy, happy church. Go in there and praise God, you know, once a week. I'm good with that. As long as you never do anything with this word, I'm okay with you going to a church. I'm okay with you reading your Bible as long as you never do the Bible. The devil's okay with all of that, as long as you never do it. But the moment you start becoming active with the Word of God, the moment you start doing the Word of God, then he has a problem. Why? Because when you do the Word of God, you renew. You renew yourself. You start walking in the person you're really supposed to be. You start walking in the new creation. Then he has a problem. Why do you think it is that when people are really starting to chase God, things start going wrong, interruption starts happening, things start coming in to distract? Why do you think that is? Because he does not want you to discover who you are. He doesn't want you to see Jesus inside you. He wants you to stay the same and never change because the old you never did anything for the kingdom of God and that's how he likes it. You become a threat to him. And I've seen every single person here that says, you know what, I'm going to get serious about God. I'm going to chase him and they start chasing him and all hell breaks loose in that person's life because the devil's watching you just like I'm watching you. And he doesn't want you to be victorious. He doesn't want you to live a life that defeats his works. And he will run interference in any way that he can. He'll run a blitz on you all day long. And if you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. You get what I'm saying, church? You have to renew your mind because if you stay the same, he'll destroy you. He'll destroy you if you let him. He'll never do anything for God. So the goal of sin is to overtake your soul and to fill your mind with wicked imaginations to destroy you. He turns you against you, in other words. So what does God say about the unrenewed mind? Well, he actually says a lot. Look at Genesis 6, 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. Why do you think, that, why do you think he did what he did with the flood? Because man's mind was just wicked. It had a natural propensity to be evil. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. And look at Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savior. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. So I got to find something else. I got to do something else. Because man's heart's going to be evil whether I drown him or whether I don't drown him. Their hearts and their minds are still going to be the same. So I got to make something different. I got to do something different. And what was that different? What was that different thing? Jesus. Because he said, I will put my laws in your heart. I will put myself in you. That way you will chase after righteousness. That way you will chase after holiness. But as long as my spirit's not in you, the sin of the fallen world will still overcome you. I need to be in you. I need to be a part of you so I can help you. Help me to walk with you. That's what God does. That's what Jesus does in us. It's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. The reason why we can choose holiness and righteousness is because of the Holy Spirit and because we have Jesus in us. Before a person is saved, the Holy Spirit is what convicts a person of sin and righteousness. And after they're saved, Holy Spirit moves in, Jesus moves in, and now you have the heart of God in you. But you've got to let it out. You've got to live it. You've got to put space between the old you and the new you. Okay? Otherwise, you stay in the old, new, old you. All you're going to do is grieve the Spirit of God that is now living in you. So if you never change after you come to salvation, all the old sins you used to do, you're now doing it to Jesus, literally, to His body and to the Holy Spirit. It's as good as Jesus or God standing right next to you and you taking them to a bar and living a promiscuous life. Would you do that right in front of Jesus? Would you go and murder somebody, you know, and hold Jesus' hand at the same time? Every sin you commit, church, I'm talking to me too, you're hand in hand with Jesus when you're doing it. Okay? If you wouldn't do it in front of your mama, don't do it in front of Jesus. 
I'm just saying, just something to think about. So the man's heart is evil from his youth. An unrenewed mind that rules over the flesh will cause you to have evil imaginations. That's why you cannot let your mind rule over you. You cannot let the unrenewed soul rule over you because all it's going to do is boss you around and make you do things you don't want to do and then you're going to feel bad afterwards. And then the devil starts to condemn you. At the time, it'll feel great. Oh yeah, I'm going to do this. But when it's over, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. You're no good. God doesn't love you. That's how the devil works. He'll say, all right, yeah, go do that sin. It's one time. God will forgive you. God will forgive you. Go ahead and go do it. It's all right. You're covered by the blood. And he pushes you to go do it. Then you go do it. And afterwards, you feel horrible. And the devil's like, yeah, you're no good. You shouldn't have done that. You're like, you just told me to do that. Yeah, but well, you're no good. You're the one who did it. Why do you listen to me? I'm the devil. See how he works? And there's people in life that actually do that too. They will encourage you to live a life of sin. And then when you mess up, they're the first ones there to condemn you. That's the devil working through people. Okay, that's how he works. Look at this. When you get down to the core of your soul, you're going to find out that it directly affects your will and your desire to serve God. What's in you here dictates how you serve God is what I'm saying. Look at Proverbs 11.23. It says, The desire of the righteous is only good. The desire of the righteous is only good. But the expectation of the wicked is wrath. Meaning if you live a wicked life, all you can expect is wrath. Okay? Now look at Luke 22 and 42. It says, Saying, Father, if you will be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What was I, I said before these two scriptures? What's in your heart will dictate how you serve God. Whatever is written in your heart is how you're going to live your life towards God. So right here, we're looking at Jesus' heart. Okay, There's two things I want to point out about this. Number one, Jesus had his own will. Okay, It was Jesus' will that this suffering that he was going through would just pass him by because he didn't want to suffer. He knew exactly what he was going to suffer. He knew all the horrible things he had to go, to, or go through for our sake, and he didn't want to do it. But what did he say? Not my will, God, but your will be done. So his will, that he would be spared that wrath. But it was God's will that he would be the sacrificial lamb for the world. But because he loved his father more than anything, he wanted to do his father's will. So when Jesus died, it was a complete and total act of love, not only just for us, but for his father, for our father. That's what was in his heart, was to be a living sacrifice for us. So what I'm saying, Jesus had a choice, guys. He didn't have to die for us. He did not have to die for us. He chose to. He had a way out. He could have very easily said, no, I'm not going to die for these fools. They're not worth it. And he would have been right. But he died for us anyways out of love. That's why we owe him everything. That's why we, our life should be for him. Because he didn't have to do it. He did it because he wanted to. That's relationship. That's love. That's restoration. There's many things in your life that you're not going to want to do, but you should do them because it's right before God. That's the kind of heart we need to have. Those are the kind of choices we need to make. Jesus had his own will, but he chose to do his Father's will instead. Jesus desired to do his Father's will. And what was the benefit of this? Look at Psalms 37. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. If you're all about God and his business, you're all about doing his wills, doing his will and satisfying him and being satisfying to him, he says, I will give you the desire of your heart. And he'll put his desires in our heart as well. So we desire what he desires. So when we're submitted to God's will, he places his own desires in our hearts. So we want what he wants. Why? Because he placed the desire in our heart to want the things that he wants for us. Does that make sense? Did I lose anybody? In other words, you think like him and you walk like him and you breathe like him and you do everything your Father in heaven does. That's what Jesus did. Mind renewal leads to an amazing relationship with God is what I'm saying. When you're renewed, you'll have an amazing prayer life. You'll have an amazing relationship with God. You'll feel unstoppable. Every time you wake up, you'll just have so much joy in your heart. Let me ask you this. How many of you wake up with joy? Just so joyful. Just happy to be alive. And be completely honest. Notice that very, very few people raise their hands. And I'll tell you, sometimes I can raise my hands and sometimes I can't. If you don't have a thorough understanding of who you really are, who Christ is in you, then you will not have a reason to rejoice. The only reason you wake up condemned, oh, I have to go through life today, oh, I got to throw the trash, oh, I got to kiss my husband. <laughs> I hope nobody does that. But the reason why you feel like that is because you are in an identity crisis and you have no idea who you are. You have no idea who lives in you. 
Your mind is the old nature and it's not been renewed to the fresh life, to the fresh start. So let me ask this question. Everybody should raise their hands. How many of you want to wake up every single day of your life and have joy? Amen. Everybody should be raising their hands. Guys, this all starts here. In order to know what is good for you and the renewed mind, you have to know what's bad for you. In today's the sermon, we talk about what's bad for you. Not very uplifting, but it's the truth. And nonetheless, it has to be preached. You have to know where you're coming from so you can know where you're going. You have to know the life you used to have to know the life you can have in Him. In other words, you'll appreciate the redeemed life more knowing that you used to be at the bottom, but now you're at the top. Okay? That's how progression goes. You recognize who you were, and now you recognize who you are. And when you see who you are compared to who you were, you're like, wow, God, you really do love me. Because only you would have given me this seat of power. Only you would have done all these things for me. Look at how wicked and evil I used to be, and look at how wonderful you made me before you. Amen. And that all comes from love. That all comes from love. Look at John first. First John 15 or 5 and 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we're renewed to the truth, we know that God hears us when we pray. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have the things that we have prayed for. We know that we have the petitions of our heart. Whatever you ask God for, if you have renewed to the truth and you know the truth and you have the relationship with God, you know that the moment you ask, it's done. It, you have it. And there is no doubt. That all comes from relationship. So if a problem comes in your life and you say, God, this problem is too big for me. This is all you. Father, please redeem me from this problem. You know better. Well, you know better than I do how to fix it. In Jesus' name, amen. And at that moment, you should have so much peace that the terror and the frustrations and the fear that that problem put on your life should immediately melt away. Why? Because you prayed. And you know that when you pray, God answers. That all comes from a renewed mind. But if you don't have that renewed mind, you may not know if God heard your prayer. You may not know if God's going to answer your prayer. You'll be sitting there twirling your thumbs and you prayed and like, oh, I just don't know if God's going to do it. I just don't know if God's going to do it. That's what an unrenewed mind does to you. It interjects doubt. And the devil's laughing at you the whole way. You understand well, how that works? Jesus' desire and will was to remove the desires of his soul and replace them with the desires of his Father in heaven. Okay? Now look at this. Jesus revealed another important truth about our soulless desires. Look at what Jesus said here in Mark. In Mark 14. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Not my will, but your will, right? We covered that earlier. Then he came and found the disciples sleeping and said to Peter and Simon, Are you sleeping? Could you not keep your eyes open for just a second? I told you to sit there and to pray, and you guys are falling asleep. They should have been watching what Jesus was doing because Jesus is the example, and they weren't watching him. Could you not keep watch one hour? And he says this, because remember, I say, when you have a renewed mind, you have a, a better prayer life with God, right? Now, look, look what he says here. Watch and pray unless you can be entered into temptation. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Your unrenewed soul, your unrenewed mind is directly connected to your flesh your mind, your will, and your emotions. So if you have a hard time doing what is right, it's because your flesh is weak, because your mind is not renewed to the truth. Do you see your weakness? It's the lack of knowledge that kills you, church. It's the lack of knowledge that destroys you, like, like it said in Hosea. What does it say in Hosea? Who knows this? What does it say? Somebody spit it out. Somebody knows what Hosea says? What, what does the lack of knowledge do? It destroys so you not knowing that you are redeemed, you not knowing that you are forgiven, you not knowing that you have power and authority in His name will destroy you. Do you get what I'm saying? The unrenewed mind knows God's will. It knows the gospel. It knows the word, or the, the renewed mind does, but the unrenewed mind does not. And if your mind stays unrenewed, then the devil can have his way in your life. Make sense? You see how all this is tied together? Your mind, your will, and your emotion is your soul. And your soul makes your flesh weak if you're led by the soul. But if you're led by the Spirit of God, then your soul will be strengthened to do what is right. And default, your flesh will also be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. But you must first renew your mind to that truth. You get what I'm saying? Amen? 
So you have to watch and pray, because if you don't, you'll enter into temptation. So the weakness of our soul and flesh can cause us to fall victim to temptation. In other words, the ways of the world. Now here's one more reason for renewing your mind. Okay, Look at Romans 6.16. Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves as slaves to obey, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? In other words, if the devil tells you to do this sin and you do it, he's your boss. Your flesh is your boss because your flesh ultimately has the choice to reject or to confirm. So if you choose to engage in that willful sin, you're destroying yourself, and you're a slave of that sin. You have become a slave. Everybody here, you know, with the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and, and, and all the division, all the hatred in the world right now, we're divided in so many different ways. We're divided between color, between, between race, between religion, um, the LGBT stuff, which is its own handful of stuff there. We are such a divided nation right now, but it's for a purpose. Because if we're divided, we can't stand in the unity of this gospel, and we fall. But everybody complains about, you know, there's a, there was a point in time where um, black people were requiring white people to apologize because someone in their family 300 years ago had a slave. Well, you need to apologize for your ancestors. And I want a formal public apology. Like, that's what's going on in the nation right now. And they're, oh, well, I'm a slave. We're still slaves. We want our freedom and this and this and that. The truth is, Everybody's a slave. I don't care what color you are. If you obey your flesh, you're a slave. In a bigger way, much bigger than color. So the choice is, you want to be a slave to righteousness, to God, or do you want to be a slave to the devil? Guess, when, guess which one's going to be a better master? Guess, when who's, guess who's going to treat you better in the long run? Not the devil. He's out to destroy you. Now look at this in Romans 6.17. It says, But thanks be to God... For you were slaves of sin, were, but you have obeyed from the heart. Why? Because what's in the heart will act out in your life. Okay? The meaning they've renewed their mind to the truth. And because they're renewed to the truth, they act out what's in their heart. And what's in their heart is life. What's in their heart is truth. What's in their heart is restoration and redemption. And because of that, they do God's will because they love God. Because they know that God loves them. That's why they're doing what's right. But thanks be to God, for you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from your heart that former teaching to which you were entrusted and have been freed from sin, and you became the slaves of righteousness. So no matter what side you're on, church, you're a slave. You will be a slave for all eternity. You can either be a slave for the devil, for sin and destruction, for the person who's going to destroy you, or you can be a slave to God, a slave to righteousness, a slave to holiness. And if you do that, guess what? He redeems you, he restores you, he blesses you. In other words, he's a good father. He's a good master. He'll treat you way better than anybody else ever will. In history, look this up, there's been many slaves who have been set free after many, many years of servitude, and they chose to stay with their masters. Why? Because their masters were good to them. They never treated them like a slave. They treated him like a son. They treated him like a brother. They treated them good because the love of God poured out from that master into that slave. And when the slave had the chance to leave or to stay, they chose to stay because they loved their masters because their masters were good to them. We need to know that our master is good to us, that God is good to us. The Spirit of God should be the one who directs you. He should be your master. He should be the one who's seated on the throne in your heart and in your mind, not your desires, not your flesh, him, because all he has is life for you. But if you don't renew your mind, you're going to be a slave to sin forever. And you're never going to live your full potential that God died to give you. So Paul understood. He understood this. He understood that renewed mind had the power to make us slaves. Here's our last scripture. Look at this. Paul's talking. He says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you have yielded your members as slaves to impurity and iniquity leading to more iniquity. Even so, even though you used to live that life, I'm telling you, it's time to change. It's time to change. Even so, now I want you to yield the members of your body as slaves to righteousness and to holiness. Why? Because he's a good God. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will restore you, church. He will redeem you. He will heal you. He will lift you up. He will bless your socks off if you let him. So I have one question for you, church. And I really want you to think about this. Two questions. Number one, 
Do you want to live a redeemed life? Do you want to have a better life? Do you really want to live to the full potential that Jesus died to give you? How many of you want a blessed life? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Okay. In order to have that, you have to answer this question. Who are you going to serve? Who are you going to serve? Are you going to stay a slave to sin? Or are you going to serve God and be free? Thank you.